It's time. The ATM podcast, normally on a Tuesday. It's a Thursday this week because of the long weekend. We'll be back Tuesday next week. We have so much to talk about with our man, Mark Watson, and in no particular order. Uh, leaks around the All Black coaching announcement and New Zealand rugby denying all knowledge, the launch of a Super Rugby Opiki, and the follow-up story to that is that uh, there's not enough money around and the players may be going overseas like the All Black you know, ready to cash in on their stature in the game. Lydia Ko chopping and changing the coach. Uh, LeBron getting the record. Let's start, though, Mark. Welcome back. Let's start with this just whole peculiarity going on around the All Blacks coach and the next coach I'm talking about. And Scott Robertson's comments uh, yesterday, widely reported across all media. And he's saying, oh, it's going to be in a couple of weeks. He seems really confident about that. Um, New Zealand rugby issued a one-line statement yesterday saying that pretty much they don't know anything about it. Yet at the same time, we've got two of the most respected and long-term experienced rugby journalists in the country, in Paul Cully and Gregor Paul, who are writing stories like, you know, they have the inside word. They are writing fact about when this is going to happen, how it's going to happen and everything. And that information has got to come from somewhere. So what do you make of all of this, mate? Yeah, afternoon to you, Martin. Uh, yeah, this is fascinating, isn't it? They say that a fish rocks from the head down. And once again, whatever is going on, there is just this perception that New Zealand rugby at the moment is completely and utterly rudderless. You're right. There is substantiated, creditable people saying that Scott Robertson's got the job. Scott Robertson himself in a press conference yesterday, when you listen to it, he clearly believes he's got the job. It's just a matter of him actually putting pen to paper. What does that mean for Ian Foster? Well, you've got to feel for Ian Foster. He's come out at the same time and is somewhat perplexed by Scott Roberts's comments and is concerned, feeling that it will disrupt the World Cup build-up. I don't quite believe in that. I think Ian Foster will play that one because that gives him a little bit of a get-out-of-jail if things do fail. Uh, Scott Robertson also being reported elsewhere that he's seeking dispensation to coach Fiji at this year's World Cup, will be involved with the Fijian program, which I don't actually have a problem with because, I mean, players are always getting um, so-called sabbaticals to go overseas. And people have criticised Scott Robertson's appointment if he does get the all-black job, potentially suggesting that he doesn't have any international experience, which I don't buy into. Um, but whatever they need, New Zealand rugby have got to come out They've got to be more transparent. They've got to be more open. They've got to be more decisive. Um, but, you know, look, in this woke world in which we live in, is there actually any room left now for proper leaders? Can you just come out? Can you be assertive? Can you be straight up without being picked apart, without feeling like you've got to go and consult a thousand people, get your language right, or you will be accused of something by our left-leading media? Um, but what an absolute just disaster and debacle and it just seems to go from one thing to the next i mean this coaching saga has now gone on for well over 12 months it continues to go on there just seems to be so much uncertainty around it the only guy that seems certain about one thing i think is scott robertson that he in fact does have this all black job going forward Look, I, you know, so much uh, to the story isn't there. First and foremost, though, just the disrespect being shown to Ian Foster. And what I don't understand from New Zealand rugby, I mean, you know, here's an administration last year that just fell over itself in a blundered attempt to try and sack the guy, um, wouldn't stand up by him, wouldn't stand beside You know, in, in those faux press conferences where they're shaking hands and he's calling each other Robbo and then Fozzie and, it's, and none of us believe a single word of it. You know, New Zealand rugby, I think, have an obligation as an employer under the set of circumstances, don't they? Just to turn around and actually just give us more than a one-line statement saying, oh, no, uh, there is no announcement. In it. We've got nothing to say on this. Look, as I say, you go back to these journals. They're not just writing, uh, interviewing their own typewriters here. These guys get got facts. We can all figure out where that information is coming from. I just think that there's just something really toady and backstabby and ratty about it. And again, you know, you look at the leadership of New Zealand rugby and you look at Mark Robinson from the very first day he got the job. What did he do? He called for a review. The guy has just got no spine. He's a box ticker from way back. We all know that. And you sort of yeah. every time you actually expect more of him, demand more of him, he just continually fails. Every single thing that he does, he is just either absent or he's just here shaking hands, making plans and doing the PR stuff. I'm so disappointed in this guy. I don't know. Who decided that he was going to be the right guy for the job? But I just feel like New Zealand rugby at the moment, 
you know, if you're going to change anything, I mean, let's forget about the All Black coach. Why don't we actually start there? Start right at the top of the administration. Oh, look, I completely agree. And I was saying this, if, if we lose this World Cup and we get knocked out quarterfinal, semifinal, lose the final, Ian Foster, they're going to need to put some people around him. It's going to be a really tough time for Ian Foster. And as we've said, look, I criticise Ian Foster, the all-black coach. I don't criticise Ian Foster, the person, the father, the husband. We have to remember that he is human. But at the same time, he is going to get maligned. He is going to cop it. But those that reappointed him or didn't make the change when a lot of people felt it should be made last year need to fall on their sword as well. Mark Robertson needs to go. I'm going to run through the board of New Zealand rugby. The right honourable Dame Patsy Reddy is the chair. I, I mean, you know, what rugby knowledge does she genuinely bring? Yes, brings plenty of corporate experience to the table. Then you've got Bailey Mackey. You've got Dame Farrah Palmer, uh, Asia uh, Bella Singham, you've got Bart Campbell, I mean, Rowena Devonport, Devonport, I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? You can look at it and think, oh, look at the balance we've got here, look at the cultural mix we've got on the board, but that is the problem, isn't it? Everything is a box ticking exercise, everything now is a PowerPoint presentation, we've got diversity, we've got the first ever woman leading the organisation, we've got this and we've got that, but clearly all of them collectively are completely and utterly incompetent. The board should be held accountable this board should resign and someone actually needs to step up and have some leadership you know they should have a mission statement at New Zealand rugby which is we are about the fan it's not it's all about the bottom line it's all about putting the head in the trough they have lost the plot not just in terms of this appointment process, but the way the entire game of rugby is being run. I mean, look, sort of going off on a little bit of a tangent, I mean, Scott Robertson gets this all-black job. I will say for the first time in all-black history, we have zero depth next year in 2024. Marquee players all residing, marquee players all heading offshore, going and playing in Japan. He's going to inherit that. Why? Why do we no longer have depth? Because we've eroded the club rugby, the MPC, and now Super Rugby. And it starts at the top. A fish rots from the head down. Mark Robertson's appointment, who put him in place? The board. Who sat down last year and made the decision to keep Ian Foster on? Who clearly in the background um, is not giving their media department, their PR firms, uh, the empowerment to come out and actually make a statement you read all their appointments you read all about their background oh you know the director of this and sat on the board of this and took this company to this place but clearly clearly when it just comes to basic common sense they're all too damn scared of taking any sort of responsibility here and oh let's just make sure in this pc world we just box tech and we consult i mean it sounds like the damn labor government with radio new zealand television new zealand coming together and amount of money wasted and spent on that <sighs> look i agree with you i've got a big sigh here because straight away what you're making me think of is this, this saudi sponsorship deal of the fifa women's world cup and the silence which is deafening from new zealand football and it's exactly the same situation mm -hmm. mate where all of a sudden you've got an administration that to promote themselves as woke warriors that inclusivity and diversity and equality they ram it down our throats every chance they get and yet here is the opportunity for them to take a stand to make a stand to actually to actually show the world who we are and what we stand for. Mark, we used to be a country, we stood up to uh, the, the French nuclear testing in the 1970s. We sent a frigate yeah. there. We marched against apartheid, and Nelson Mandela heard that in his prison cell on Robben Island. You know, we used to be a country that put our hand up and said, there only be three or four million of us, but guess what? We don't like this, and we're going to tell you why we don't like it, because we don't believe in this kind of stuff. Here you have the Saudis, who are trying to sports wash by sponsoring the Women's World Cup. It's the most inappropriate sponsorship there is. And if you listen closely to that sound there, that's the sound of cowardice from Andrew Pragnall, the CEO of New Zealand Football, and the board of New Zealand Football, who all they've done is piggyback a letter from Football Australia, co-signed it and said, oh, we want clarity. And also, I'm pointing the finger at Sarai Behrman, who was here promoting the Women's World Cup. You couldn't get her off the television screen or off the radio, every single interview. Well, where's her voice now? And why yeah. isn't she speaking out about this? you got football ferns. So many of them are openly, proudly gay. You can't live like that in Saudi Arabia. This is wrong on absolutely every level. And look, the, football, the, the Players Association has spoken out a few parts Past players have spoken out. Where the hell is New Zealand football? We're hosting this goddamn tournament. Why aren't they standing up there and yeah. saying, FIFA, this is this is bloody wrong. You know it's wrong. And we're going to tell you it's wrong. 
Oh, no, uh, you're 100%. We've forgotten, actually, who we are as a country. We've forgotten that she'll be right attitude. You've forgotten that we have been a country who has stood up, again, you know, wailing apartheid, as you mentioned, giving women the vote, taking the stance on all that sort of stuff. You know, it's funny, isn't it? Because a few years ago, we had the people standing outside of Parliament um, protesting in and around um, whether or not we should be vaccinated or not. And we had, I think, the Prime Minister Ardern at the time saying, oh, these are not real New Zealanders. And I'm like, well, hang on a minute. You don't have to agree what they're protesting about. But that's what New Zealand's famous for is protesting. So suddenly when they're protesting about something you don't like, we're no longer New Zealanders. I mean, I just sit there and go, oh, OK, it's this whole thing, isn't it? You can protest as long as it's something that we agree with or something that I agree with. It is so incredibly woke. And it's, it's you know, I mean, symbolic of this country right now is the Orange Road Code. It's the Orange Road Code. Hey, let's just put an Orange Road Code up and let's shut everything down and let's take months and months and months to get it fixed and make a decision. And it's no longer Edmund Hillary on the $5 bill. It should be an Orange Road Code, symbolic of just how this country has just come to... Uh, I mean, I almost feel trapped here as a New Zealander. You just want to get up and disappear sometimes, Martin. Hey, hey look, look, I just want to change it up quickly, just sticking with oh. the rugby thing. Look, I, I see Aaron Smith has announced that he's going to leave New Zealand long-term contract to Japan. Well done to him. Great All Black. Same. Good on yeah. him. Then I, I read the Bowden Barrett bit, and Bowden Barrett's going off for another one. He's going to go to Japan too, but he wants to keep the door left open to come back to New Zealand. And here we've got New Zealand rugby in the blues seriously entertaining this idea. This guy has not been a good rugby player for the last 12 months, for the last two years. So the World Cup goes, we're going to go down to play Japan, and then what? We're going to spend a fortune trying to keep him back in this country beyond 2024. It is time to move on. Let's waste a million dollars keeping Bowden Barrett here. Meanwhile, the infrastructure of clubs around the country is struggling. The Mighty Ten Cup struggling. Club rugby struggling. You've got a lot of young talent coming through. Oh, but no, we've got to keep Bowden Barrett here. Why? What? Because he's got 10, 20, 30,000 Instagram followers. Oh, I mean, it's unbelievable. We'll let all our coaches go overseas. We'll let them all disappear. But beyond 2024, we'll do everything to keep Bowden Barrett here. He doesn't want to play rugby in New Zealand anymore, Martin. Okay, the All Black jersey is not that, does not mean that much to him. If it did, it would be a simple decision. I'm not going overseas. I want to still be an All Black. But oh no, moronic New Zealand rugby. Hey, we've got to have the brand. We've got to have experience. I mean, it is just utter nonsense. Let's finish on Lydia Ko, because I just love the story that every second day she sacks one of her management team. She doesn't sack any of the family, of course, who are her management team. I'm talking about caddies. I'm talking about coaches. And the poor bloke who's just married her, he must be looking sideways at this going, okay, so... Yeah. How long do I have here? It's just bizarre, isn't it? I, I don't know any athlete in the world that achieves and overachieves like she has. And last year was one of her best years in what, probably the last five or six years. And so what do you do? You decide to change it, break it again. Just when it's actually fixed, you want to smash it to the ground and rebuild it. I just don't, I don't get it. I mean, you know, prove me wrong, get another caddy, win every single major, sure. But there's just something really weird about the way that she operates, isn't there? There is, and you still wonder how much influence there is in the background from the parents, because this has been something that's gone on for a long time, even when I think she, you know, was still very young and maybe didn't have the life experience to always make those decisions. You'd like to think that now that she is married, um, that, yeah, she's in complete control of her career. But are you passing the buck? Are you not accepting responsibility? Do you still believe you can be better because but you've just got to get some of these outside influences right. You can't keep changing. This is sort of gets to the point where you start to sort of, you know, you've got people in the background coaching by committee. It's interesting, isn't it? Because you look at the great golfers, you look at the great players uh, on the men's side, particularly, you do not see this happen. There is a blueprint for success. It's about continuity. It's about consistency. And yeah, and you wonder, you wonder if she, yes, number one golfer in the world still hasn't won another major championship. Well, you know, whose fault is that? Whose fault is that? Where does the responsibility lie? Uh, I mean, you know, and yeah, and I think that's part of the big reason why at 17, she was the number one in the world. And then she went into pretty much no man's land where a lot of people didn't feel that she was ever going to bounce back from it. She has bounced back, but hey, hey, rather than looking at the success model, let's go back to the way I've always done things. Let's chop and change and it'll be fascinating to see how this year goes for Lydia Coe again will she improve will she go backwards will she stay the same Martin